All right, guys, we just got the call for a uh, medevac off of a 55-foot fishing vessel. It's a young male. He's in his 20s. He got a hook in his arm uh, while fishing, and uh, the hook got ripped out, so it took some veins with it. So he's got some significant bleeding from his left arm. The crew members on deck got like a makeshift tourniquet, so they're using makeshift tourniquet and pressure to stop the bleeding. Fishing hook had went through his arm, so he needed to be medevac to uh, higher medical care to get it. The bleeding stopped, first and foremost, uh, but also hopefully to repair the artery. So we want to try to get there quickly, as safely as we can. The only significant weather we have is in between the boat flying north. It's about 100, over 100 miles to Anchorage. There's some uh, mountain turbulence and some mountain obscurations due to cloud. The concern was is that if we couldn't get this guy to a vascular surgeon within four hours, that he could possibly lose his arm. So there's a really heightened sense of uh, urgency with this case. All right, does anybody got any questions about what we're doing, where we're going, how we're doing it? All right, let's go do it. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. did the launch on a medevac about 130 miles northeast of Kodiak. We got the C-130 flying with us. It makes things much smoother. They give us an outlook on the weather, winds, visibility, and pre-briefing the boat before we get on scene. So it really helps us prepare ahead of time and speeds things up. The air rescue assist, please. Sorry, sir. What's our ETA right now for the boat? ETA to the boat, one hour, five minutes. Roger. So what are you guys thinking, a basket to put the jack down? I don't necessarily know if we need to put jack down. The only thing is that if somebody has to apply consistent, constant pressure to the wound to keep it from bleeding, that's then we're going to need jack to go down. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about, is that they don't have the proper tourniquet on. They've said that they've applied a tourniquet, but the tourniquet is made of fishing string. We got the C-130 beat us on scene by about 30 minutes, and then got word that the bleeding has not stopped. And uh, I've been worrying at how much blood he's lost and what I can do to stop that bleeding. Sir, I'm, I'm already thinking that they've got something tied on his arm. It's not a proper tourniquet, so the second somebody loses it, it's not even going to do its job. You want to get down there and put a proper tourniquet on? Yeah. Do you think that's better, or do you think minimizing the time and just hoisting them directly? This tourniquet that I have, I can apply it in under a minute. Oh, OK. As we're getting on scene, we had a light tailwind about 10 knots. It was helping us get to scene faster. So we were able to close that distance 103 miles in less than an hour. And we got the vessel at 2 o'clock. As we make this right-hand orbit here, guys, to set up on the stern, everybody take a really good, hard look at the vessel, OK? We have door seats. Yep. C-130, pre-brief the captain how to prepare the vessel and give them the hoist brief um, before we arrive, which really saved time for us. All right, so we got the booming rigs off the port stern side, and we got cables going down to those booming rigs, and all the cables going to those booms. As we get on scene, we get eyes on the boat. My big thing is getting a suitable hoisting area. There's a bait shack, and on top of there, there's an open area. That's what we decide as going to be our hoisting area. Yeah, over there to the, uh, the right side, right by the stool, it should be good. Roger. All right, rescue checklist part two. So after we get done with our briefing, we uh, bring the swimmer to the door. What's going through my mind is just need to make sure I get him down there safe, knowing that we had a time critical situation to get him down there quicker than normal, but still safe. I can get the bleeding stopped. I'm going to send him up in the basket, keep in the trail line. You're going to send me the hook down, come back up. All right. Our plan is load and go as fast as possible. Uh, if need be, if we can't get the bleeding to stop, uh, I'll probably go up with him some way with me applying pressure to the wound. This will be a, a swimmer deployment with trail line while underway to the stern of the optimum on the rear right side there uh, from an altitude of about 60 feet. Any questions? No questions. The average commercial fishing vessel here in Kodiak is riddled with multiple booming rigs, cables, 
and stanchions all over the boat. So a lot of times it's really challenging, and sometimes it's not even possible to get the swimmer down through the rigging. Service connected fair line, going outside the cabin door. And if you just fly easy back, sir. Just fly easy left, that's back. Okay, so check six, we're going right now. Right five, actually right 20, sorry. The boat's rocking and rolling. Uh, I'm trying to hold the helicopter as steady as I possibly can. And then the swimmer's swinging on the cable. So you got three different elements moving all different directions at the same time. It's really difficult to get the swimmer on a certain spot. Six, five. Back. Ten. Hold. Back and right. Five. Right. Ten. All right. Hold. Airlines on deck. Fire swimmer's on deck. I got hoisted down, and the guy that was tending my trail line, he had big, wide eyes, he seemed pretty nervous. So did the rest of the crew. Down and good. Hoist please. But once I was lowered to the boat, I uh, walked over. I see Joe, my survivor, on the ground. The crew seemed a little nervous. You could definitely see the shock on all their faces with the amount of pain that Joe was in. They had uh, what looked like fishing string tied around his arm. They did a good job as far as slowing the bleeding. They had packed multiple torn T-shirts, rags. They definitely were trying to get the bleeding to stop. Let's get back off a little bit so they can hear. Can't really see what you're doing. First thing I did was applied my tourniquet. I wanted to make sure that the bandage stayed on the arm, but I didn't have any of things with me because I just came down with myself and the tourniquet. So I asked for tape, and the captain actually gave me some duct tape, which is perfect. All right, here they come up the ladder. Roger. Summer, zero 05, go ahead. Zero 05, Summer, uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and send them up in the basket. I've got the tourniquet applied, bleeding is stopped, and uh, getting ready to come up on deck. Summer, zero 05, Roger. No one is the basket boys. Not only is it quicker for us, it actually it's easier. It's a, a relief not having to use the litter. Uh, using the litter, you have to rearrange the cabin and kind of make room for it to fit in there. So this will be a back delivery with outro line to the stern of the Optimus. Now through the 50 feet, we'll walk away. Any questions? No questions. Quick, quick. Joe is uh, on the verge of passing out. He has pale face. He's very cold. He's slow to answer questions, and he's having trouble standing. So I knew it was his time to load and go. Good noise. I'm going to turn going on like a rest halfway down. Right 20. Back and right 10. Back and right 5. Easy. Right. Hold. vessel Optimus had a crew member get injured, a fishing hook had went through his arm and then was ripped out and actually severed his artery and was bleeding profusely. Pass the contact, be intended. Now the signal, take load, take the load. Joe is uh, on the verge of passing out. He's having trouble standing, so I knew it was his time to load and go. Pass clear as flowers, clear to the back left 40. Clear back left. The hoist went really well, less than 15 minutes for the whole hoist and evolution is pretty quick. But the challenging part there was, you know, we had the survivor on board, but the case isn't over. You know, we have to get them to our destination. What's uh, our uh, ETA, sir? ETA to Anchorage, hour and uh, 15 minutes. Roger. Yeah, when we got him up in there, we kept him in the basket just so he can kind of rest his arm on the basket and keep it elevated above his heart so he's not going to be drawing blood down to the wound. Joe, how you feeling? Your arm hurts. Are you dizzy at all? 
you favor, open your eyes real big. You feel any of that? No. Back in the cabin, I'm thinking of the next thing I'm going to do in steps as far as applying oxygen, taking care of the wound, and monitoring vital signs. I want to keep Joe warm right now because I want to keep him out of going into shock. He's really cold. His, his skin is very cold to the touch. Joe, I'm going to keep your arm wrapped, OK? No, huh? What's going to happen is right now, once you apply a tourniquet, you don't want to ever take it off because what's happening is your blood is clotting over this big open wound right now. And if it's not completely healed and you remove this, you're going to start all the way from ground zero. So until you get to the dock, don't remove anything. If you start feeling dizzy or anything, you let me know immediately, OK? Open the prop underneath his arm. Yeah, here, I got the uh, sling. So he said the hole in his arm is probably about the size of a nickel. And uh, the guy that was holding his arm shut said he was actually squirting blood. But uh, he definitely does not have circulation towards his hand. We need to get him to a vascular surgeon within four hours. So we had about an hour left of that four-hour clock. So we were, uh, the sense of urgency was, was there. So I pulled all the power that the helo had. Hey, right, guys, we're going to cut through this little valley here on the right, just shave up a couple miles. Right. So because of the cloud layer and covering the top of the mountains, the mountain obscuration, we chose to stay low, and uh, we got to fly through the valley up to Anchorage. Three for eyes approach. Three for approach. Cross the ground belt. Yeah, go ahead. We're going to approach. Roger. We arrived uh, at Anchorage Hospital, and uh, we landed actually on the roof, which was the first time for a lot of the guys in the crew. So it was kind of interesting to do that. You clear to come down? Tell someone right. Roger. It's a big sigh of relief when you're able to pass the survivor off to higher medical care and be able to see them exiting the aircraft still in relatively good condition. Hey, right, Joe. I'm gonna bring him out and keep him in. Take it out. Right. Got Joe out, and uh, we took him down into the emergency room. We had a small conversation. And he thanked me, and he told me to say thank you to the crew. And it was a good feeling to know that Joe was in good care. Well, my name is Joseph Webb. I'm commercial fishing for halibut and black cod. We're going to go for a skydive. And so this is two parachutes here. There's a main right there, and then a reserve, which is packed by an FAA rigger. We just had a nice 10-day trip, and uh, we were long for halibut. That's where you haul a big, long line with a bunch of hooks on it, and hopefully a bunch of fish. And uh, yeah, one of the hooks kind of popped out as it was coming over the rail, popped and uh, grabbed me kind of in the elbow area, and uh, kind of started dragging me into the hauler. So I just I ripped it out and started bleeding very heavily. That's it. I've been through a lot of injuries, and this one scared me in particular because we're so far out. We're about 100 miles offshore. You know, I was kind of nervous because you never really want to call the Coast Guard. You know what I mean? You never really want to be in that type of situation. You know what I mean? So it was like, oh, shoot. Man, I really kind of messed up this time. I didn't feel too much relief until I saw the diver sliding down the rope. Just seeing someone risking their life for me, you know, and luckily it was really nice weather, but still, you know, just doing that kind of stuff uh, from a chopper to a boat in any situation, you know. When we got off the chopper and walked in, there's like 10 doctors explaining to me what ended up happening was I ended up ripping out a vein. Arteries pump blood to the limb, and the veins take the blood back. So what was happening is my limb was filling up with blood and not able to take any back. It was totally numb from the tourniquets, and uh, that kind of scared me. I was pretty worried there for a second. <laughs> that was awesome.
awesome. Thank you, Coast Guard. My Kodiak guys saved my butt so I could do this. Thanks, guys. All right, the hazards are the superstructure. They got a net around the top of it. With the winds and the motion of the boat, we had a concern that we might swing the rescue swimmer into the side of the superstructure. Safety float, take the load. Clear on back left 30. Flight mechanic had said, you know, clear back and left. It was that, that clue to me that we don't want to be here any longer than we have to. Good afternoon. You're listening to KCAW Sitka. It is uh, just after 12.30 p.m., and we are about two hours away from uh, an opening of the herring fishery. Alaska Department of Fish and Game has announced that the fishery will be opening soon if you're interested in getting out there and checking it out. So we're going to be headed out. We'll be checking the fisheries. There's quite a few boats south. We'll take a look at some of the boats that are out and about. So if you guys see anything, make sure you holler out. Right now, there's a ton of boats in the in the Sika Sound area. Um, we're gearing up for the Sika Sound Sacro herring fishery. One time a year, really short duration, high intensity fishery. We're going to be working on a Coast Guard response boat, small. It's a 25 foot boat. Water's clear. Water's clear. Can I see the chart? Thank you. The fishery is one of the last remaining derby style fisheries. It's get out there, catch what you can and the potential exists for uh, bad things to happen, unfortunately. So our primary mission is to be a search and rescue asset platform should something bad happen. Great of boats here. Now we got a newcomer charging in. 15 seconds. Push forward. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, open. Sick of Sound Sacro Fishery is now open. Sick of Sound Sacro Fishery is now open. You can see the boat lines that are working out there. Oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch out here. Look at them. Funny sometimes when you see them when they realize we're here, how many boats also start going. Oh. <laughs> oh, look at that. There's a native boat uh, on the water. He's got branches. He's going to. I'm looking at that. What's going on? What's going on with this? So they take branches and they drag them through that, trying to pick up all the herring eggs and get them to stick to the branches. It works. I've seen them at the dock, man. They come back loaded. We're out here just trying to keep the peace among the boats, try to uh, put a damper on some of the aggressive maneuvering the boats have been doing, and reduce the risk of collision or injury. We got a close one over there. Uh, let me see actual contact. I didn't see contact over there. On a derby-type fishery, all the participants have a limited time and a limited area to go ahead and fish, so the competition is very fierce. The maneuvering gets really aggressive. They block each other. They try to outmaneuver each other to set their nets. But they know that we're watching them very carefully, and it seems to ice them a little bit. Brian Howie, I've got the uh, infinite glory here. In the herring fishery, there's an explosion of people here that come in all at once for this, and it is a competitive fishery. It's critical to have the Coast Guard, you know, when you're out here by yourself. You never know what's going to happen here. As a commercial fisherman for over 20 years, I've had nothing but uh, the best experience with the Coast Guard. I've actually been plucked off a boat with my wife. Uh, we, we lost a 58-footer, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago. And an ugly night in October, and uh, nobody around, nobody there, but they were there. And um, I mean, literally, without them, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. This case wasn't a typical alarm like I guess we're used to. My wife and I had just finished dinner and movie with some friends, and I was out walking the dog, and the phone rang in my pocket. They said, uh, you know, don't come into work until 10 o'clock tomorrow. You're going out to ADAC and bring an overnight bag. OK. As soon as we got there, another crew had already ferried the helicopter out to ADAC, and it was refueled and ready for us. I finally got the, the full information on the case from our ops center there. A uh, young crew member on the Anmet Bulker had uh, fallen about seven meters, about 22 feet, and uh, it essentially just sort of landed on his face. We knew 
that his left leg was immobilized, and so he wasn't able to walk on his own. So right off the bat, we knew that it was gonna be a litter hoist. We're basically hoisting the survivor up in a stretcher. So we're gonna be low, we'll have a headwinds. I'm gonna, probably two hours on the way out there. Head injury, so we're thinking low on the way back. Yeah, as, as best you can. How many miles offshore right now? Um, they're 230 miles offshore now. So, that's the mission. Um, when was the last time you hoisted John? Probably 30 days ago. Okay. Tool bolt. Tool bolt. Yeah. You're current with everything? You can look at not comfortable with it? You can set, check your own survival equipment because it's going to save your life. Young crew member on the Anmet Bulker had uh, fallen about seven meters, about 22 feet, and uh, it essentially just sort of landed on his face. Do you current with everything? Anything you're not comfortable with? I think that's it. Check your own survival equipment because it's going to save your life. Before break through it. Yeah. At that point, you consider what type of injury the person has, what the vessel looks like, you know, what your hoisting platform is going to be, what the weather out there is going to be, you know, winds, sea state. We Pretty much had a game plan. All right, ready for starting engines? Oh, yeah. All right, we are off the deck. Flight controls, center of gravity. Do you feel good? I feel good. Ceilings were probably about 3,000 feet. The only thing that wasn't working out as well as we had expected was the forecast of 20 knot winds were closer to 40 or 45 knots. Looks like we're starting to get a radar contact a little shy of 50 miles out. This guys make an approach. To probably around 200 feet, we'll stay up above the superstructure, find out exactly where we're hoisting to first. About 50 miles out, we started getting a return on radar that we were able to correlate to the position we were expecting it. Large lumber transport, merchant ship. The vessel had a large superstructure on the aft portion of it, and the whole forward part of the vessel was stacked with lumber almost all the way up to that superstructure level. All right, guys, boats at the 1 o'clock. They are definitely loaded with lumber. I see some guys on the, the left bridge wing. I also see a guy down on the lower deck after the superstructure. Looks like we got the patient right there. So I think that's going to be our hoisting area. We got the rail. There's a lot of things sticking up. Yeah, do you see on the starboard side, they got like a hose ring out there? Yeah, that's a fire hose. You see the guy in the big potato suit? Uh, yeah. All right, on the left side of it, there's another like a single cone sticking up. Yeah, I see what you're talking about. Basically, I'm thinking of going right in that open area between those two cleats. That sound reasonable to you? That's fine. Are you, are you good with that? Eli, yeah. 500 foot hoist? Yeah. I'm gonna try to put you right behind those two hose reels on the port side. Perfect. The transom, the very aft portion of the vessel, right behind that superstructure, was about a 20 foot long section of main deck with cleats and mooring lines and things like that. That was gonna be where we were hoisting to. Point All right, the hazards are the superstructure. They got a net around the top of it. You got the hose reels and the two cleats. I'll have you copy in, and then we'll put Eli straight down. Sure. All right, swimmer. Check swimmer. Our general plan was to put the rescue swimmer down to the deck, have him assess the survivor, also to assist with the hoist. Swimmer's ready. And then to lower the litter down, have the survivor prepped from the litter, and then just reverse the process, bring the litter up, followed by the rescue swimmer. Swimmer's on way down. The area that we decided on, the captain called it the poop deck, which was just basically the back of the boat. It had probably about a 10 square foot area that we were able to get into. Someone's going down still. Roger. Did you right? With the winds, how they were, I started swinging. So the flight mech did a pretty good job of keeping me from hitting anything or running into the superstructure. Uh, so it was pretty difficult hoist. All position. Someone's on deck. Uh, retrieving hoist, sir. On deck, captain was right there. Told me he fell about seven meters, so about 20 feet. Primarily on his left side, uh, his face was pretty uh, swollen and bruised up. He had been bleeding out of his ears and his nose, and over the night, he couldn't move his leg, so he was pretty banged up. Go ahead and uh, prep for that litter hoist. Go right now. Roger. All right, Eli's coming out on deck, and uh, he's got the ready for pickup signal. But this will be a trail line deployment of the litter to the port side of the poop deck. Litter's going open out the cabin door. Lowered the litter down to him, the 135 
feet above water level. There's halfway down. Do a good job. Exert. There's about three feet free from the vessel. It was a difficult hoist in terms of it being that high of a hoist and not like not really having the depth perception of how high things are up. There's on the vessel. Former is on the litter. Brought down the litter. Put him in the litter, uh, kind of assessed him before we did that, just made sure he was doing OK or wasn't anything else I needed to do for him, safety-wise, spinal precautions and whatnot. Hooked up the litter and sent him up. All right, ready for pick up. Roger, copy it. Roger, right pin. Break up load, and take the load. Litter's clear of the deck. Funeral back at left 30. Clear that. Litter's on its way up. Litter's coming up, and uh, swimmer's staying out your line on deck. The recovery of the litter, I was surprised with the height and the winds that it didn't spin at all. The litter came straight up. Litter's at the cabin door. Pulling it in the cabin, I had a hard time because the litter ended up getting stuck on the troop seat bar. I was trying to pull, and it was not coming in the cabin. But I finally got it in the cabin, and then just recovered the swimmer. Good job getting the bench up. Rescue brief. Be a bear hook down, harness recovery of the rescue swimmer. Retrieving the rescue swimmer. Now with the winds and the motion of the boat, we had a concern that we might swing the rescue swimmer into the side of the superstructure and possibly injure the swimmer. Take the load, take the load. Clear back left 30. Flight mechanic kind of leaned in a little bit and said, you know, clear back and left. It was that, that clue to me that we don't want to be here any longer than we have to. So we brought the aircraft away from the vessel, kept the rescue swimmer safe, and was able to bring it back up to the aircraft without any problem. Swimmers in the cabin. Got everything situated in the cabin, and then did my assessment of him, what was hurt, if he was bleeding anywhere, anything like that. His whole left side was tender. He was grimacing basically every time I touched his arms, face, neck, uh, shoulder, rib cage, hip was the worst. We found out later that he had broken his hip. How's the patient look to you, guys? Uh, so far, he's got good blood pressure, good pulse. I mean, he's pretty banged up, but other than hauling 21 feet on his face, he seems to be OK. I don't want to pry open his other eye. It's pretty swollen shut. His uh, left eye is not as reactive to light as I would like it to be. He smashed his face pretty good. Oh, yeah. He definitely see a lot of blood in his mouth. Yeah, he said he was bleeding out of his nose and his ears. He's not, not currently bleeding anywhere. He's probably got a good concussion. And from what the medic said, he said his whole left side is bruised. But I don't want to, like, cut his clothes off right now since he seems to be warm. And I can't do anything further than that. Yeah. Four lane checklist. Report ready for approach. Ready for approach. From that point, we had the survivor on board, and it was the transit back to ADAC to get the survivor onto that further medical care. The plan was to use a C-130, and we had that aircraft. It was equipped with a special medical pallet, and we had uh, additional Coast Guard medical personnel who came with us to continue the case and take the survivor all the way back to Anchorage. 20-something-year-old male had fallen 20 feet the survivor had a head laceration on the left side above his eye. He also had bilateral leg pain, so both of his legs were in pain. My duties was to just maintain his airway, maintain his vitals, and basically be on the edge of my seat if anything were to happen that we weren't expecting. Pilot HF. Uh, we just took his blood pressure, and I don't know if you guys know anything about blood pressures, but it's uh, 155 over 128. Normal blood pressure. 120 over 80. 120 over 80. We got back to ADAC and transferred the survivor to the C-130. And we had uh, additional Coast Guard medical personnel who came with us to continue the case and take the survivor all the way back to Anchorage. Uh, we just took his blood pressure, and it's uh, 155 over 128. Normal blood pressure. 
120 over 80. The biggest concern was the altitude with his head injury specifically. If we go above 1,000 feet in cabin pressure, the vitals can change, and then we can possibly see a cardiac arrest patient or a respiratory arrest patient. I piped up, told the pilots, hey, his vitals are going up. The flight engineer did mention that he changed the cabin pressure just a little bit so they could get over some terrain, and they were just going to go back down as quickly as they could. Pilot, this is HS. Go ahead. So we're just trying to make him comfortable. I'm going to try to avoid giving him morphine just to make sure that he stays awake. So. Okay. Did you take down that blood pressure? It's 118 over 79. Okay. That's much better. Once we knew that his vitals were back down to normal, we were all sort of relieved. It was about. 2.30 in the morning. Once we did get to Anchorage and we knew that an ambulance was going to be on the tarmac waiting for us. It was raining and the paramedics met us directly at the door of the C-130. And from there we knew that he was transferred over to higher level of care in Anchorage, which is one of the best you know, medical facilities in the state of Alaska. Probably want to take him to Juno. Yeah. Pretty efficient on the airplane. Um, weather well, is, is pretty uh, dark, so we're going to go around the outside. Okay, Spencer, that way. So we got called tonight for a medevac from the village of Huna for a gentleman there having some chest pains. He needs to get over to the hospital in Juno. Ceilings are kind of high, and the risk is reducing. It's dark, so it's going to be dark. Questions? No. All right, yes, let's sir. go. We're going to spin him. Tonight, the weather, you know, the ceilings are down well under 1,000 feet, three or 400 feet some places. Visibility in the rain showers is getting down to a mile or two. So we're going to use our low visibility routes, especially since it's nighttime, and we're going to have these pockets of reduced visibility. And we're going to be going through some areas that are actually pretty tight. A couple of the passes we'll go through to get into the village, less than a half a mile or so wide. So we'll definitely be on our game for the navigation. That's going to be the, uh, the hardest thing we're going to be dealing with tonight. All right, that's hot. And earn them. Engaging in the field. Your, uh, on his way out right now. Roger. Based on the initial call, we knew that uh, it would be better to have additional medical personnel on board, so we elected to bring the corpsman, HS3 Miozzi, along with us with the rescue swimmer. All right, so we're going to confirm everything you've got here. Guy with a heart attack in Huna. You guys got everything you need to take care of him? Yeah, we, we do, sir. Uh, you mind if I keep the AC2 in place? That's fine. Executor from a rescue 30. I have you loud and clear. We are airborne from home plate Sika en route to Huna for the medevac case. Also request to know if you can inform the ambulance we will be there in one hour and we'll be meeting them at the airport. How copy? So AC2, when I called it was a male in his mid 60s. He's been having chest pain since about 40, 45, 50 minutes ago. He's got cold sweat, he's pale. Been due to the clinic, he's gonna put some morphine and get an EKG on us. That sounds fine, man. We did a little bit of pre-game beforehand, just like, hey, if the situation shows up, what are we gonna do? And we discussed like eventualities in case things went bad, what kind of gear we're gonna bring to the patient, what kind of meds or O2 or leads, just stuff that we wanna have out ready to go. Like you're bringing the drugs or what? Yeah, morphine and uh, nitro. Morphine and nitro? Yeah. We knew that there was areas of isolated rain showers and some high winds. We knew it was going to be dark. There was no moon illumination. So we headed offshore, so we were able to stay away from terrain. How's it look off the up there? Do you have any illumination whatsoever? No, uh, we did the water under a rain cell right now, and it's uh, 15 to 20 miles. Straight in, rain is pretty hard. So guys, we're going to air taxi over the breakwater, go up between a gap of the trees, and go onto the runway. 
Roger that, sir. Flint is a pretty small little town here in southeast. A lot of native Alaska folks. They do have an airport, um, but it's a real tight airport. It's in a little valley uh, back in, so the commercial uh, airplane medevac services can't get in there at night, so that's why we get called tonight. Flint is fog right over the runway. And you guys have door speed. Roger. Goes up. Once we get to the airport, uh, really, my job's done. We're going to get our rescue swimmer and our, our corpsman out, and they're going to go hook up with the uh, the EMS folks from town, get a good pass down on the patient. And the EMS is here, which is nice. Clear out, sir. Clear it out. Clear it out. Once we landed in Huna, Miozzi and I got out of the aircraft and walked over to the ambulance, uh, where we made first contact with the patient. He was alert and oriented. He was awake and talking to us and uh, kind of giving us a little rundown of what happened. But you could tell he was very tired. You could tell that he'd been through a lot that night and uh, he wasn't in the best shape he could have been in. The initial call was the 63-year-old male out of Huno suffering from a heart attack. that he'd been through a lot that night and uh, he wasn't in the best shape uh, he could have been in. With any cardiac case, you don't want them walking around. So AST2 was already way ahead of me. He grabbed the litter, assembled it. So we moved the patient into the litter and we brought him into the helicopter, and from there, we had already made plans to monitor vitals and just keep the interventions going, and then reassess every five minutes in case the situation changed, because cardiac conditions can rapidly deteriorate. How's he doing? He's doing good. He looks pretty stable. Not though, but doing fine. OK. When we got him in the aircraft, we really assembled it for worst-case scenario. We had the monitor set up to him, we had oxygen, we had pads for the ED set up on the side in case he were happened to crash. Uh, we'd be able to slap those on real fast and be able to possibly shock him. Yeah, sector 6030 is lifted from Luna this time, 7 POB. ETH, you know, uh, 0300 local. Our main goal at that time is just to keep him stable, keep him uh, you know, warm and dry and comfortable for that transit. You gotta remember, our aircraft isn't an ambulance, it's not a hospital room. You know, it's gonna be loud, there's gonna be water in the cabin, but we just gotta do the best we can. He's still got some recurrent chest pain. The nitroglycerine apparently took his pain from a seven out of 10 to a three out of 10. The EKG was pretty tachycardic, which means it was a faster than normal heart rate. So throughout the flight, I'm asking him, hey, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. And he was giving me thumbs up throughout the flight. And Victor from 3 0, we are landing assured in Juno. And uh, just want to confirm that the ambulance is waiting. Okay. Roger, the ambulance is going to be waiting for you. Over. The ambulance is rolling down the taxiway, so I gave him a clear in signal and got ready to take the patient from us. Search and rescue in Alaska is really different than anywhere else in the country. You can take a patient from the most secluded village here, and they can end up all the way down in Seattle in one case, really. We have to use four or five different agencies to get one person to a hospital. And if that didn't happen, there'd be no chance of survival. Our dad is our hero. And if it hadn't have been for the Coast Guard and their team coming into Huna, to pick him up, I have no doubt in my mind that he wouldn't have made it. He would not be alive. When I finally got to see him, you know, the doctor told me he had a 5% chance of making it. Didn't look like himself. He was just pale white and just lay in there. He had a total artificial heart put in. It's a bridge to transplant till we can get a heart transplant for him. When I first came in to see my dad, it, he was, he looked terrible. He was almost dead. So it was gut-wrenching. I didn't know what was gonna happen. I'd like to tell the air crew thank you, and I'm so glad that I get to go home to my kids and tell them that their Papa Jack is doing great, you know, and 
and I'm just so thankful. My name is Richie Parra. I'm an aviation survival technician in Sitka, Alaska, and I'm getting married today at uh, Magic Island in Sitka, Alaska. Ooh, it is raining. Okay. It wouldn't be Alaska if it wasn't raining, so today I'll be marrying Shannon Fleming. She was actually a corpsman in the Coast Guard and recently got out and uh, moved up here with me and planned to live the rest of our lives together. Move out! Yeah. Feeling great. Very excited. Time and the tides are moving in here. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like we're still getting married, like as the water's coming up. That would be awesome. We chose Magic Island. It's a pretty cool island that's only accessible at low tide because uh, the water actually covers up the path to get there. I'm actually kind of nervous about how fast it's coming in, to be honest with you. It's, it's moving faster than I thought. My name is Shannon Fleming. My new name is Shannon Parra. I chose Miami, Florida for a flight medic billet and there I met Richie. I never thought I'd come to Sitka, but here I am nine years later and it's just everything we are. I wouldn't have it any other way. It was perfect. Richard, will you repeat after me? I, Richard, take you Shannon. I, Richard, take you Shannon. To be my wife. To be my wife. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. What pledge do you bring today showing the sincerity of your vows? A ring. <laughs> when I saw Richie walking to the altar, I knew that he wanted this. He absolutely loves her. And I can't imagine a better match for him. They fit so well together. Richard, you may kiss the bride. Mm -hmm. We're proud of what he does, and we're proud that he's able to help other people. I think he's loved her for a long time, and as long as they're happy and they're healthy, that's all we ask for. 